well, I want to welcome you all back, our second concert in the series this year. So the key about this ensemble, and this is um, something I always love about Chamber Music Monterey Bay, is not only do the programs challenge me as a musicologist to really do my homework and discover things, uh, but also the interesting sonorities, the interesting distinctive programs that come to our stage. And with this trio, what we have, if you don't already know, is a pair of double reed instruments and a piano. So we have the oboe, the bassoon, and the piano. What's interesting about that is, of course, we're switching from our really predominant stringed instrument-based chamber music tradition, although we've heard, we've heard a variety of instruments on this series. But we're switching to wind instruments, and in particular to double reed instruments, and once more in particular, two instruments that are in the same family. So the oboe and the bassoon match each other in timbre and feel, much like the violin and cello match each other. And of course, our piano is there to always, uh, of course, not only support what are primarily single note melody instruments with harmonies, but also with great percussion and to participate lively, uh, lively in a three-part counterpoint. So I think you're really going to enjoy the program tonight. What's even more interesting, uh, to me anyway, is two of the works on the program tonight were scored specifically for this combination. Of course, the Poulenc piece and a very modern piece from Andre Previn that was written, I'm going to forget the date, but I, I want to say it's 1994-ish. Um, so very recent piece, also scored and probably very much influenced by the Poulenc piece. We have two other pieces on the program that are only slight adjustments from their original scoring. In one case, we're going to replace a clarinet with the oboe. In another case, we're going to replace the clarinet with an oboe and a cello with a bassoon. And finally, with our Shostakovich pieces, uh, one piece, we have a transcription because it was written for an entirely different set of forces. And I just wanted to point out that it's really interesting to look at the long evolutionary process of these instruments, how they come into being, how they then stay in the tradition. The oboe, or the double reed instruments, go back a long way in history. Ancient Asia, the Middle East, Turkey, and they made their way as, like so many other instruments, along the trade routes into Europe. And it's around the early 1600s that the oboe appears in France. It appears in writing and begins to be made by a few French instrumental uh, makers. So it really appears, in a sense, only shortly after the violin, although as we know, the violin as a bowed instrument also has you know, predecessors and go back, goes back into ancient history. So these double reed instruments, oboe and bassoon, uh, have a very long history and are, are really refined, evolved instruments that have stayed. And so it's very exciting to have them on the stage tonight. It's a super program. As always, there's way too many things that I can talk about. I wish I had hours. Of course, you would hate that. Uh, but there are many wonderful things to look forward to on the program tonight. So as usual, I'm going to try and kind of you know, touch upon as much as I can uh, and highlight some, few, some things to watch out for and what I, some things that I find to be compelling about the program. But before I do that, I want to do a little ear warmer. So I'm taking a, a page out of the book of Amy Anderson. I don't know if Amy's in here, but I think she usually loves this idea. So let's kind of open up our ears, kind of listen to a little something just to, to get our oral senses going. And it does relate to the program. For this first example, I want you to um, just listen to the sounds, the mood. Maybe it'll bring a composer to mind, a period to mind just something kind of easy to get us going musically. So our sample number one. Let me, I'm gonna start that again. Sorry, my volume was down.
wrap it there. Um, pretty, isn't it? Lovely. Any ideas? What, uh, you can just shout out some ideas that it might remind you of or bring to mind. Any, anyone? Any associations at all are valid. Haydn? Luli. So it has a, to me, a definitely a dance, definitely a three, kind of a three count waltz going on there in a very gracious way. Luli I like because it has a very, um, it has a kind of a French Baroque sound to it. Anything else? Cuenca. Well, you know, we always do these things from our presentations, and, and most of you, if you think, you think, well, it's got to be related to the program somehow. <laughs> Turns out Shostakovich, 1955. <laughs> so I wanted to surprise you with that. This <laughs> This is one of the pieces uh, uh, that is part of this gadfly suite, uh, from which we're going to hear one selection tonight. It's too bad, in a sense, because it's an absolutely wonderful piece of music. It's about 43 minutes long, with several uh, movements in it. And it was written by Shostakovich, 1955, as a soundtrack to a film, naturally. And you can read more about it in your program book. What's interesting about that to me is to think of someone like Shostakovich, who is in my mind, and I know I've said this repeatedly up here myself, it's my own opinion, a gigantic titan of a composer who belongs with all the greats, such as Haydn. Um, it's interesting to consider that writing for a, sou a soundtrack for a film is a distinctly 20th century discipline. It's not a symphony, it's something quite different. Uh, and there's so much wonderful music in this, and it's curious to note that in 1955, when he wrote this soundtrack, he had already produced 10 symphonies, six string quartets, ballets, a couple uh, revolutionary operas, and just a few years earlier had decided to write, uh, which I also bring up because I adore this piece of music, a set of 24 preludes and fugues modeled after Bach's well-tempered clavier. So we're talking about a gigantic poser, a composer, not kind of a Hollywood hack here, and he decides to write the soundtrack. So I, the surprise is up, so let me give you another sample from the same piece of music. Again, this is Shostakovich. If we think of his string quartets, his symphonies, this is a totally different side of Shostakovich as a composer. The thing, I, the thing I want to emphasize um, just briefly, because we have a lot to talk about, is you know Shostakovich was such a gifted composer in so many ways. A lot of his music is challenging, forbidding, intense. But what's interesting is he knew how to do all this. So when you hear his forbidding, intense music, he knows exactly what he's doing. He's leveraging this great tradition. The piece you will hear tonight from this suite, I'll give you yet another little sample, features, again, some delightful music and a beautiful melody. And I think it was Schumann, I could be wrong, who said that the gift for melody is the surest sign of a divine gift. It's true, composers who have an ability to write beautiful melodies over and over again, something very special about them. And actually that applies to most of the composers on the program tonight. So here's just a little snippet of the so-called romance that you will hear tonight.
So I bet if I played that for you again without advance notice, you probably would never say that was Shostakovich, I'm guessing. So you have something to look forward to. And again, if you want to seek it out, it's from this uh, soundtrack called The Gadfly. It's a wonderful treat, 43 minutes. This piece, as you'll hear tonight, it gets rather intense. It has a very interesting middle part, and then it comes back to this soaring melody. And there's some really fantastic music throughout this suite. So you might want to check it out. We're going to hear one more piece from another set of incidental, incidental music by Shostakovich. And this represents the wild, exuberant circus side of Shostakovich, also with a sense of filmic quality to it. And it's called A Spin Around Moscow. And I don't need it all to give you a taste of that, because the second it hits you up there, you'll get it. So we're going to have a couple lovely treats from Shostakovich. A tribute to the, um, or I think brought into the program by two of our musicians tonight who are Russians. I want to move on to Pulank then, and particularly Previn, because I want to expose you to a few aspects of these pieces. Um, the Beethoven and the Glinka really need no help. Actually, none of this music needs any help, because you all love music and you have ears. But if I, if I can swing back, I'll talk a little bit about those pieces. With Pulank, we move. Uh, interestingly, to, into a musical realm that, again, relates very much to Shostakovich, the sense of color, circus, almost cinematic qualities. And we're going to hear this piece, his trio for oboe, bassoon, and piano by Francis Poulin, from 1926. Again, your first thought might be, oh no, you know, modern 20th century music from the 20s between the two, war, war, the two wars, I guess I'll kind of just bear that piece. It turns out that this is a delightful piece of music, if you don't know it. In fact, if I played it for you, I've already blown the secret, but you probably wouldn't even guess that it was a 20th century piece of music. You would by certain traits, but it's really so classical. And that's one of the main points of this piece, is that Poulenc is what was a French composer who was part of a young generation of composers between the two world wars. Now, World War I essentially decimated the whole tradition of late romantic music. It was discarded along with all the terrible tragedy of the revolutions that happened at that time. So, com so composers were looking for something new. One of the options was Schoenberg and this whole new you know, reinventing of the tonal series with his atonal music, then his serialism. And this group of French composers absolutely hated that concept, probably mostly because it was Germanic and Austrian. <laughs> <laughs> what they gravitated towards is they loved jazz, they loved cafe and cabaret music, and they wanted to go back before the excesses of bloated romantic mu music to the clarity of the classical and even the Baroque period. What's interesting, though, is, is so th what they did, and Poulenc did this in particular, is to take classical structures and procedures that you would recognize by someone even like Mozart, and then wedded onto that a certain tartness of 20th century harmony, a certain leering, almost uh, uh, satiric uh, parody going on, and also elements of jazz because this was seen as such a bohemian revolutionary aspect that it was a great antidote to 19th century romanticism. Um, and I, what I was going to do is play a little bit of Beethoven uh, from the piece tonight to set up a classical introduction and then follow it with Poulenc so you have a reference, but don't quite have time to do that and I don't even think you need it. So what we're going to do is dive right into Poulenc's trio, the first movement, and think of these ideas. Um, the notion of a very classical um, orientation or posture, but spiked with this wonderful sense of 20th century bohemian kind of radicalism. And even though that in itself may sound a little frightening, Poulenc again was a composer who was gifted for writing melodies. His Probably his most famous work are all his art songs. Uh, but this is a stunning piece of music that's absolutely accessible all the way through, but I think it will make you laugh quite a bit too. So here's the opening taste of this marvelous piece of music. Thank you.
delightful, wasn't it? Abs just sparkling. Um, I, I said Poulenc, of course, was French, and from many French composers, there's a very strong trait running through their music of this, what's often referred to as a clarity and a wonderful command of color and a love of wind instruments as well. So this music is 20th century. It's very distinctively French, but it's very distinctively a masterwork from Poulenc in very much of his own voice. That was movement one. Movement two is a, a just a beautiful slow movement. And I made a note to here to bring this up that I'm skipping all the slow movements in my, my talk because they will all speak for themselves. But there's an interesting pattern you'll notice tonight, which is all of the works except for the Shostakovich are essentially three movement works, a little disclaimer on the, on the Glinka, but we'll call it that, uh, that follow the simple pattern fast, slow, fast. And I usually refer to this as the sandwich or the Oreo cookie. <laughs> the idea is that we have two outer movements of like qualities with this creamy center. And what we're gonna hear in all of these works, um, including the Previn and the Poulenc, both modern works, are these beautiful middle movements that really capture our hearts. And I think that's what we want from composers. We want the first movement to kind of dazzle us and, and, and challenge us somewhere in the work to really capture our hearts and take us away. Maybe the last movement is fun and games and some extra virtuosity. Okay, there, there's your whole formula, go write music. Um, but in this case, you will find this with Poulenc, and so it doesn't need any exposure. The Beethoven, if I may just say as a side note, um, Beethoven kind of gets the back seat because, um, you know, we all know Beethoven. There's nothing to say about him, really. Except, I love this piece of music tonight, and it's very rarely heard. His trio, uh, written for clarinet, originally cello and piano. We're going to hear it, of course, for the, the uh, choice from the Poulenc trio. His slow movement tonight is absolutely divine. It was written in uh, 19, uh, excuse me, 1798, before Beethoven had even started writing quartets for symphonies, so it's a very early work, but it's absolutely beautiful, and it will capture your heart. So we're gonna hear that from all our composers. Instead, we'll jump to the last movement of Poulenc, because I'm gonna give you one more example of his charming wit, his beautiful mastery, and this whole phenomenon that we might call neoclassical. And for those of you who have uh, sharp ears and good memories, you'll notice that he is invoking another composer in this little snippet, uh, in the true sense of a neoclassical reference. So here's um, the last movement, just a little highlight of it, of the Poulenc Trio tonight. And by the way, it's a rondo in very standard classical form. <laughs> There's one common comment about neoclassical music, which is it's kind of like classical music with some wrong notes thrown in. And I think you kind of heard that in that piece. You know, it seems to be flowing along and all of a sudden there's something kind of tart and a little bit smirking going on. But again, I, I think you're really gonna enjoy this piece. Anyone catch the reference? Does it sound familiar? Beethoven, Beethoven. what Beethoven? Beethoven. Exactly, I, I don't even know either. I was, I was hoping you would know. So it's, yeah, so it's one of the scherzo, I think from seventh. Yeah, I think that sounds about right. But so what he does is he quotes it and then he immediately veers off into something completely Poulenkian. So I think you're really gonna enjoy this piece. Um, let's jump into the Previn, which comes again much later. Now Andre Previn, uh, many of you must know from a variety of contexts. He is um, you know, now an American citizen. He was born originally in Berlin, I think. You know, escaped the Nazis, moved here to the United States with his parents when he was a young boy, and settled in Hollywood. Now in Hollywood, he had a great uncle who did uh, soundtracks 
and a music production for the film business. So he had music in the family, and he gravitated to that very quickly, and made his name originally as what they call an adapter in Hollywood. What he would do is he would take classical scores and sort of rescore them, arrange them, touch them up to be suitable as film music. Uh, he's a great pianist. He had a career as a jazz pianist and toured around doing all kinds of jazz work and, of course, was a conductor, a noted conductor for at least a decade. So he's considered to be one of the most you know, versatile composers, uh, uh, musicians all the way around. What he garnered in his career, incidentally, so far, he's still alive. I think he's 83. Uh, he won four Academy Awards and ten Grammy Awards in his career for his work on film in particular and for many of his recordings. And then he decided, of course, to turn to more or less serious classical music. And he's written a large canon of works, including a number of works for chamber music. And so, in, as I say, I think it was 1994. Someone could correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's in the program. Not too long ago, he decided to write his own trio for oboe, bassoon, and piano. And to me, as I listen to this piece, these elements that I try to highlight come out of the music. You hear some film qualities going on. You definitely hear some French elements and a relationship to Poulenc, and you definitely hear jazz. So without further ado, I want to give you a little sample from the last movement of Previns. And I think, in particular, I picked this little section because you're going to hear the oboe and the bassoon, which we'll hear tonight naturally. You'll hear the piano, so you can almost imagine Previn himself playing it. You'll hear some very distinctive jazz elements. I think that'll bring a smile to your face. But you'll also hear yet another element of his that, I, that makes me want to describe his music as purely American, which is this quality that, and, and you're going to laugh, I, I'm going to use this term, but it, it sounds a little pejorative, it's not, but it describes what I mean. It's what I call on Golden Pond New Age music. <laughs> and what I mean by that is this kind of very distinctively American music that draws, I want to say, from kind of hymn, hymn music. It's very simple, open harmonies but it has a very, it tugs on your heart, and it's, I don't mean to say it's trivial or you know, bad New Age music, but it's distinctive American, and so you're gonna hear that in this sample, along with these jazz elements and this instrumentation, and a little bit of a back and forth. So, and I'm saving as a surprise the way this all wraps up at the end of the movement. So this is a little slice from the middle of the finale, and remember I said all the works are a sandwich, so we're gonna have slow, fast, slow, a very reflective, beautiful slow movement from Previn, and then a fast movement at the end. So here's our little example of kind of jazz, piano, oboe, bassoon, a little bit of ongoing pond new age music. <laughs> One of the things that this piece, whenever I keep listening to it in the context, is that the Poulenc Trio has really put together a wonderful program, because all these pieces kind of interrelate to each other. Um, you can hear, I think, definitely elements of the Poulenc, definitely elements of the Shostakovich, in a sense. Um, there is this personality running through all the music. 
and in the last two seconds, I do want to just return to Glinka, but first to point out another thing I love about this Previn piece. Um, he, you know, in a very 20th century, even American style, has decided to not title his movements, you know, Allegro, Geo, Coso, Cone, whatever. He's called them lively, slow, and jaunty. <laughs> you just heard jaunty. Glinka, I have to mention, Glinka is regarded as a, um, a, a real father of Russian music, of course. He, his noteworthy contribution was um, a, a two or three really important operas. So he was primarily an opera composer. And what he did is he took the kind of prevalent Euro European tradition at the time, and with the dates we're talking about, he took uh, Bellini and Rossini primarily, and adapted their style to Russian folklore, tales, and folk music, and, and began really to ignite a whole national character in Russian music. So he's, he's prized for that and became a model for more famous composers after that who you would all know. But when he was a young man, he was very interested in absorbing the Western European tradition, and so he wrote some chamber music. And one of the things he wrote in, in 1832, is where this piece comes from, is a trio for clarinet, bassoon, and piano. So the one substitution we'll have is the clarinet becomes the oboe tonight. It's referred to, of course, as the trio pathetique. What's interesting about this piece of music is it comes before Schumann and Mendelssohn, before their respective trios that he might have used. So as you listen to Glinka, not only was he a great pioneer in Russia at the time, but he really was reaching out and being innovative in a Western European sense. What he had as models were Schubert and Beethoven, essentially, and Mozart, not bad models by any means, but you're going to hear in his music a light operatic quality, a kind of a pathos, um, and a romantic leaning, and it's really a very effective piece of music. It's four movements, but curiously, the first movement, sonata, and the scherzo are mashed together, attacka style. So they run together, and at the end of the scherzo, it kind of quotes the beginning of the sonata. So we have kind of a three-movement work, very beautiful slow movement, and an intense finale in the key of D minor, so it's our one piece tonight that's in a little darker cast. So I really prize, again, the Poulenc for bringing this Glinka to our attention. So thank you very much, and enjoy the show.